Hello, my name is Ginny Schuster, and this is an installment of Longmont Public Media's Candidate Interview Series. I'm here with Gary Hodges, candidate for Longmont City Council, Ward 3, running against incumbent Susie Hildago Faring. Hello, Gary. Welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. You'll have time for a summation at the end, but since Time is limited. I'm going to start right off with the okay. first question. Are you ready? Yes, I am. If you are elected, what is the biggest issue that you want to address? And is that issue actually within the control of city council, or is it something that requires a ballot measure or state level action? Oh, the biggest issue I'd like to address. <laughs> You know, I have a number that I'm thinking about, but I'm going to go with what is maybe um, the biggest issue on my campaign platform. And that's what I believe is an idea to get rid of our 0.4% tax that we pay for fast tracks. I was on transportation board for seven years, and back then I had doubts that it would come. And today I think we all understand that fast tracks commuter rail is not going to arrive in long run. So I believe RTD Fast Tracks also understands that, and they are continuing to push forward with the idea that they're going to they're going to bring a train here. I think if we come to the negotiating table and we tell Fast Tracks that they don't have to give us a train, they're going to be relieved. This is going to be a big burden off their shoulders, and I think we will all agree that we can relieve ourselves of the 0.4% tax in lieu of the train. Now, this doesn't mean we walk away with nothing. What I would bring to the negotiating table is we want greater headways, more frequent headways to Denver and Boulder. We would like to see a return of specialty rides for sporting events and maybe even concerts and other special events that happen in Denver. Maybe an airport run direct airport run. If you try to ride RTD to the airport from Longmont, it's long and it's burdensome. It's not practical to do that. So ultimately what the train was going to give us was transportation from point A to point B. And I know there's a lot of allure of train. I get it. I understand it. But ultimately we want to get people to where they want to go. And I think that's a big idea, and I think it's something that we can get done. I think the majority of Longmont would be supportive of it, and I think RTD Fast Tracks will also see the wisdom in, in this idea. I would ask you about the airport, because that's a fascinating concept that people hadn't thought of, but I don't want to run out of time. So keep that in the okay. back of your head, sure. all right? Sure. Okay. Question number two. There are several safety and crime reduction measures the public has asked for, such as Vision Zero, restorative justice, and increasing the police force. Which of these solutions do you think are effective, and what else should the city council do? Well, off the bat, I would go for bolstering our police force. There's been pushback against police over the last few years that we're all aware of. And that's had negative consequences. Senate bill, I think it's 213 or 217, a uh, couple of years ago got rid of qualified immunity for our police officers. That has had a very real impact on police officers across the state. I know a police officer that gave up on the profession and that was, that was part of the reason. So I would like to see us well, an idea I have on my solutions-based platform is to restore this qualified immunity. So the city of Longmont pays for a liability, uh, uh, a liability policy to protect police officers that are operating in good faith. And that is something tangible that they can hang their hats on. It's not a meaningless platitude like, oh, we support our police officers. It's something meaningful and it's something real and it, sh it would show our police officers that we stand behind them. And I think it will also help with recruiting. So if you're a veteran officer in a surrounding community, say Fort Collins, Thornton, Broomfield, wherever, right? And let's say you've got 15 years experience, 10 maybe, and you're not happy where you're at. You'll look at Longmont and you'll say, 
that's a city that supports their police officers. That's where I want to work. And I think that would help bolster our police force, give us a good mix of veteran and rookie officers and make the Longmont Police Force the, the crown jewel of the front range. There are other ways that we can approach this um, that relate to retention ideas. So we might look at bolstering uh, medical payments or coverage between retirement age and Medicare. That's, I know, something that's an issue for our police officers. Um, we could look at maybe even housing assistance. So I know a lot of police officers, I know they say they don't want to live here, but a lot of police officers don't want to live in Longmont. That's something I found out. They, they, they want to live removed from the city so that the people that they're interacting with and sometimes arresting, that they're not running into at restaurants or what have you with their families. So we look at retention. We look at ways to make our city more attractive to work in. And um, I think that that's where I would head first. Thank you. Good response. And I would have a follow-up question on that, something to that you can keep in the back of your mind, where community involvement might get in there. So let's move on to question number three, though. What is your vision for the future of Longmont's transportation network of vehicles, streets, sidewalks, and multi-use paths? Well, I'm in favor of all of that, okay? But a truth to transportation, is we are a car-focused community, state, country. We're not going to get rid of the car. Um, so I would do what we can to facilitate car traffic around the city. Now, that doesn't mean we pull back on other, other options, for example, public transportation. Public transportation is on the minds of a lot of people, and a lot of people have a lot of support behind it. I spent seven years, again, on the Transportation Advisory Board, a lot of history and knowledge of RTD. One of my favorite ideas on my campaign platform this year is a way to encourage youth participation in public transportation. If you have a driver's license and you have a car, it's a tall order to get you out of your car and onto a bus to drive to work or wherever you want to go. I know as I rode the bus for one year to, to Boulder, it increased my commute by two hours a day. It's, it's a hard thing to, to get someone to do who doesn't have to commute. So I'd like to reflect back two decades on Mary Leona Stacker's wildly successful Painted Goose project. I floated this idea while, while on tab, it got good response. I don't really remember why we didn't pursue it further. But I would like to see us partner with Art in Public Places to put out a request for proposals for area artists to submit designs for bus stops along that we would install along Main Street. And we can take the models that they submit. Maybe there's a dozen or so models, and then we're trying to pick between six. We have all the models in the library. And then we put these really colorful, interesting bus stops up and down Main Street. So imagine now a child, six-year-old child, is driving down with their parents. They're like, Mom, Dad, you know, what is that? Oh, well, that, well, that's a bus stop. Well, what's a bus stop? Well, can we, go, can we go to this bus stop and see what it's like? You know, so maybe they take it and they go, okay, well, let's get on it and ride. So is, is this going to be the be-all, end-all for youth participation? Probably not, but it's a smart way to start. And it also meshes right now. RTD has a youth ridership promotion that they're working on right now to encourage youth ridership and they're they're eliminating fares for 19 and under so it just happens i put this out there and i opened up a letter from rtd a few weeks ago and i was like ah oh, look at this you know rtd has the same idea i have so it meshes exactly with what rtd wants to do and i think it's a smart move and it would be a lot of fun it would be really fun to see you know a really funny bright little house or a big mushroom or something along main street it would be. I like that idea. <laughs> I like looking at that art. Yeah, I do too. So question number four, the high cost of housing makes it difficult for service workers to afford to live here in Longmont. Do you believe that they should be able to? And how do you believe it would impact the lives of current residents if they could? Well, this is coming under the category of affordable housing. You asked it in a different mm -hmm. way. Yeah. This is really what we're talking about. And one thing that really concerns me in the city's pursuit of affordable housing, this 12% goal, 
and I'll just say an aside, you know, what is the end goal? Do, do we think if we reach 12%, it'll be magic and everybody will be served perfectly? Um, but the truth of it, I believe, is it doesn't eliminate a burden. It just shifts that burden to another group. So you take a, you take a property away from market housing and you put it in the affordable housing pool it's going to increase the, the cost of that market rate housing. So in effect, what you're doing is you're taking a dollar from one person and you're giving it to another. But it's a bit more insidious than that because there's inefficiencies in the system. So you have to take a buck and a quarter from someone to give a dollar to someone else. And so, you know, some portion of that is disappearing. And so what that means is the burden you eliminate for one group, you've shifted to another, but not only shifted it, you've now expanded it. And it's particularly in cities because you can, you can identify, you can even shake the hand of the person that is sitting in the house that was affordable because they met some income limits or what have you. But the other group, though larger, you can't identify those people. So it also what it does for that person, that service worker or what have you, right? Maybe they get into this house and okay, nice. But we've we've increased that cost of market rate housing. And so at some point, they probably want to transition out of that, out of their affordable housing, their deed restricted house or whatever it might be. But now they're kind of trapped in this, in this affordable housing because we've amplified and accelerated the housing costs of the market rate. So I'm not opposed to pursuing affordable housing. If somebody comes to me, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, and a proposal comes forward that I don't, that I, that I analyze and I believe it's not going to have a negative impact on market rate housing and just shift the burden to someone else. I, I would listen to that and I would support that. But I think we really need to be careful. You know, it's the tantalizing allure of a simplistic solution. And it's not so simple. That's a good description of how you describe that. Thank you. All right, now we're going to go to question number um, five, and this is about the ballot issues, the three questions on November's okay. ballot. We're going to go over each of them one at a time, and what I want to know is, do you think that the public should support each of these and why you feel that? So 3C, new branch library and library funding. Well, I'm going to have about the same answer for all of these. So I'll just start. I haven't said all of them, though. Well, I... <laughs> Would you like all I'm of glad them? That, I'm, glad, I'm glad they're on the ballot. And I'm glad the public is voting on it, okay? Because that's going to give us the true measure of should we do this or not. Uh, they're coming in a particularly bad moment. Our property taxes are going to be a lot higher beginning next year. They are now, but we're not seeing that pain in the moment. So maybe, you know, for those that are supporting it, it's good they're on the ballot right now. Shall I go ahead and tell all of them? You know, yeah, yeah, right. So all right, we have the rec, the rec Center, the YMCA, right. and, yeah, and the, okay. All right, so 3D is Arts and Entertainment Center, and 3E is Recreation Facility. So if right i'll let you carry on sure from here and i don't want to gloss over your original question and i will get to that but i just want to say in, in the scope of where we're at with this property tax and our state legislator completely dropping the ball not putting in uh structural uh change like they promised and instead giving it this horrible it hh that everybody should vote no on um so this is going to be a problem, and this is going to be a problem for municipalities like Longmont in the future, because as taxes become more burdensome, it is going to get much more difficult to get measures like this passed in the future. Well, you mentioned HH. Can you expand on that? I'm not sure I know what that is. That's, the, that's okay. So our property taxes are going up, and that's because of the valuations and the end of Gallagher, and there's a few other things in there. And this is this is Governor Polis and the state legislature uh, tried to do a last minute thing to say, oh, they're going to this will actually reduce your property tax, but you have to give up your Tabor. So in the end, you're actually out more money. You might reduce your property tax negligibly, but all of your Tabor is gone. And so in total- you Tabor, can you expand on what Tabor? Taxpayer Bill of Rights, it was, it was in part, it limited 
limited tax increases uh, you had to vote on them and that's why we have fees now on our car uh, when we go to renew our tax there's so many fees instead of taxes um it's a topic we can get into but I, I would like to get back to to the ballot issues so it's likely i i don't know how i'll vote it's likely i'll vote no on all of those not because i don't think they're good ideas i just am concerned about the taxing issue right now and how that's going to impact me personally, my family that live, live in Longmont, and other residents of Longmont. Now, I love the idea of a rec center. I love the idea of expanding the library. I love the idea of swimming pools and, and all of this. I, I don't think these are intrinsically bad ideas. I think the moment is an opportune. I know a couple of council members have said there's never going to be a great moment. Um, but, man, this is a particularly bad moment. So, Again, to, to finish where I started, I'm glad it's going to the voters. The voters are going to decide on this. And if they if they choose to pass these right now, uh, wonderful. Then we'll, we'll move forward with them as laid out. Okay. Do you, is there anything that you'd like to add to any one particular one on, you know, the library or entertain arts and entertainment center or recreation you know, facility? The, the, the arts and entertainment center, I think... This, this is where we, it's, my understanding, it's envisioned as being 800 to 1,200 seats. So I think the size of it is right for a city the size of Longmont. Uh, you know, it's against the backdrop of uh, First Bank Center on 36. That is going out of business or they're going to close it down, however you want to characterize it. That was a venue that went in and they anticipated about 200 events a year there. They were only getting about, I've seen many concerts there, actually. It's a concert's. For a long time, was one of my primary forms of entertainment, and I've been I've been in that venue a lot. I like that venue a lot. It's a great place to see a concert. But so I don't know. I don't know what it would mean to have a 1,200 seat venue here when we have the Boulder Theater uh, in Boulder uh, to compete with. Um, my my son-in-law is in a band, a popular band on the Front Range, and I asked him about this, and he was pretty negative on a concert venue. Um, my daughter plays flute; she teaches in public school. So does my son-in-law. Um, so kind of having the idea for a, a more classical kind of music, I think is interesting. So I, again, I, I'm not opposed to the idea intrinsically. I just, the timing of it is really tough. Okay, super. Thank you for being thorough. Now I'm going to let you allow you the rest of the time for a summation. Okay, thank you. Now well, let me have a sip of water before I head into that. I guess I'd like to get into why you want to vote for me, even if you think you don't agree with me ideologically. All right. It's, some people are going to watch this and they're going to go, I, I like him. Fine. And then some people are going to watch this and go, I, I don't like what he's bringing to the table. All right. That, that's going to happen. It's a simple fact of life. If I'm elected to city council and I'm sitting there, the other six members, the five members and mayor, and I'm in the minority, just likely if I get on there, there's a lot of ideological alignment on city council. I will be bringing different ideas and different discussion to the important issues that they're facing. And I've seen this by attending council meetings and I see 6-0 votes on topics that I think are rather important that I feel like you have not addressed significant important points of this. And I will address those points and I'll bring it, I'll bring it up. And I will, even if I'm in the minority and I'm outvoted on a particular issue, I will, I will force the policy to be better articulated, better written, and have a better impact than it would be without me on council. And so if, if the idea of diversity is important to the voter, it's really what we're getting at there is diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, okay? And we use skin color and other things as kind of a proxy for political thought, the idea that diversity is going to lead to better ideas. That can be debated whether or not that is in fact true, but that's what I will bring to the table is diversity of ideas. And, and I'll make city council better, I'll make our policy better, I'll make resolutions better, whether or not I'm in the minority majority or minority on that on that front so that's what i'll offer to the voters and that's that's my way of suggesting why you should vote for me even if you don't think you agree with me ideologically it, it'll be a way to get better policy 
Super. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> Thank you for all your input on all these questions. I'm Ginny Schuster, and I'd like to thank all of you for watching the Longmont Public Media's Candidate Interview Series. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure being here. Thanks.